Sort of Koto. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll ask Dr. McElnay to run through the latest numbers, and then we'll uh, spend a bit of time talking about vaccination before opening up for questions. Thank you, Minister, and uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, today I'll give a short update on today's cases, the latest on the situation in Waikato, and finish with some um, updated advice on the gap between vaccine doses. But firstly, I'm very sad to report the death this morning of a patient with COVID-19 at Middlemore Hospital. Further details will be available later today after discussions with their family. But on behalf of all New Zealanders, I'd like to recognise this family's loss and offer our deep sympathy. Turning to today's new cases, there are 39 new cases in the community to report. 30 of these cases are in the Auckland region and nine are in the Waikato. That brings the total number of cases in the Waikato to 18. There are also two cases to report in recent returnees in our managed isolation facilities and one further case in a border worker which remains under investigation. The whole genome sequencing is underway to determine whether that case is linked to the border or whether it will be classified as part of the community. Of today's 39 cases, only one is yet to be linked to a current case, and interviews into this case are ongoing. And also an update from yesterday's cases, there are four which remain unlinked from the ones that were reported yesterday. We have 12 active subclusters where there have been recent cases and they still remain the focus of our public health response. So looking ahead, we estimate from the number of already notified contacts that there could be an additional 36 cases in coming days amongst known household contacts. For hospitalizations, there are 32 people in hospital with COVID-19, seven of which are in ICU or a high dependency ward. For testing, Swab numbers remain high, with 24,714 swabs processed yesterday throughout the country. In Auckland, there were 13,331 swabs taken across the city. So thanks to everyone who came forward. In Auckland today, there are 22 community testing centres open. Of these, 16 are pop-ups, including a new centre at Hillsborough Park, while the Manukau Sports Bowl pop-up has now closed. Back to Waikato, of the 18 cases in total in Waikato, of which we're reporting nine new ones today, we know that they are all linked to known cases, either as household contacts or socially. Two of these new cases are, are, reside outside the alert level three boundary in place, and that's at Kafia and Karapiro. Auckland DHB are setting up a pop-up testing centre at Karapiro. Karapiro. There are five pop-up testing sites operating in Hamilton, Raglan, Huntley and Tokoroa today, with all five being open for extended hours to cater to any expected lift in demand. An, an existing site at Founders Theatre Car Park in Hamilton remains open. Waikato DHB have also informed us that a patient visited its emergency department last Friday night between 10.30 p.m. and 1.55 a.m. That person has now tested positive for COVID-19. The patient was asymptomatic on arrival at ED, was screened by staff who were following alert level two infection prevention and control protocols. Despite adhering to these protocols, out of an abundance of caution, the DHB has temporarily stood down a number of ED staff who are self-isolating, undergoing rapid testing with results expected later today. Some of these staff were working in a different part of the ED to the case, but are still being tested as a precaution. Public health staff at the hospital are continuing to investigate this incident and working directly with every affected staff member and we expect that some will be able to resume work following a negative test today. There does continue to be exposure events at hospitals. This is not unexpected. It is important that people get help, help when they're sick, and it's important that we know that our hospitals are safe. 
Our hospitals have strict infection prevention and control measures in place, including the use of appropriate PPE. However, for smaller contained exposure events where there is a low risk to the public, going forward we, we won't um, be routinely reporting on these, but we will continue to report any exposures of significance. And finally, in light of the increased risk from the current Delta outbreak, the Ministry of Health is advising New Zealanders to consider a shorter gap between the two doses of the Pfizer vaccine than the current standard of six weeks. That's because we need to protect ourselves, our whanau and our communities. We need as many people as possible to have their first dose to be partially protected, but we also need all those people to be fully vaccinated with two doses as soon as possible. In August, we extended the standard gap between the first and second doses of Pfizer vaccine from three weeks to six weeks to allow us to give one dose to a larger number of people faster. But now, by enabling um, people to have that second dose sooner, um, but after at least three weeks, more people can be fully vaccinated sooner and hence increase our community immunity. Back to you, Minister. Thank you, Dr McElnay. Clearly, cases outside of the boundary uh, are a stark reminder of how tricky the virus can be to manage and, of course, how dangerous it can also be. We're seeing COVID-19 tracking down unvaccinated people uh, and it's making them sick. Our goal is to get the vaccine to people before COVID-19 finds them. We've now fully vaccinated half of the eligible New Zealand population and in Auckland, around 85% of people have received at least one dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Yesterday, 63,624 people received a dose of the vaccine, the majority of those being second doses. Because we're an innately competitive country, it's worth noting that the North Island and the South Island are now neck and neck in the race to be the most vaccinated island, both islands sitting at precisely 80% of their eligible population having received a first dose. This week, a 30-strong team has been set up to support disabled people to access transport and to get vaccinated in a way that suits their needs. Uh, it's another piece of our plan towards continual improvement to make the vaccine accessible to everyone. So to speak with uh, support specialists, people can call the COVID-19 vaccination health line on 0800 28 29 26. Uh, it's free. Uh, that's from 8am to 8pm Monday to Friday. If they press 2, uh, they'll speak to the right team. By far the biggest and most powerful weapon that we have in our fight against COVID-19 is vaccination. Vaccines reduce the risk of getting COVID-19, they reduce the risk of getting really sick if you do, and they reduce the risk of uh, the rate of transmission. They're safe, we've got plenty of them, and everyone over the age of 12 can now get them. Our strategy to date of keeping COVID-19 out and vigorously pursuing cases that do emerge has served us very well, but we can't keep doing that forever. And new challenges like the emergence of the Delta variant has made it harder than it was before. As the Prime Minister said on Monday, getting back to zero cases of COVID-19 in the community is now unlikely. We need to prepare for a gradual transition to the next phase of our COVID-19 response. New Zealanders have consistently shown over the last year that they're willing to pitch in as part of the team of 5 million and to help us confront the challenge of COVID-19 head on. We need to channel that energy into a final big push to get New Zealanders vaccinated. We have within our reach another significant COVID-19 milestone. We can be one of the most highly vaccinated countries in the world, but to get there, we will need a big collective effort. We all have a role to play in getting our vaccination rates up. So my message to the 80% of the eligible population across New Zealand who have had their first dose is this. Your job is not yet done. Uh, you still need to make sure you get your second dose, but you also need to help us reach those who have not yet been vaccinated. You need to help us get them comfortable with being vaccinated. So we want you to talk to them about the reasons that you have chosen to be vaccinated. We want you to help make sure they get reliable, honest information about the vaccine. And we want you to help deal with any logistical barriers that may have stopped them being vaccinated. The next week and a half is critical. We want to pull out all of the stops to increase our vaccination rates. It has never been more urgent. 
So we're asking everyone to contribute to a big nationwide push for vaccination. This will culminate in a National Day of Action for Vaccination on Saturday the 16th of October, Super Saturday. On that day, we'll have vaccine clinics open throughout Aotearoa all day and into the evening. And a bit like on Election Day, we'll be asking all of our civic and political leaders to contribute to a big effort to turn people out. We currently have 350,000 appointments available on Book My Vaccine over the next 10 days, and that doesn't include vaccinations available through many of our general practice sites, where around 20% of New Zealanders have been getting their vaccines. We're working to increase that capacity even further, but what we need now is demand. Tomorrow we'll be releasing maps that show where the highest concentrations of unvaccinated people are by suburb. This will be helping our local iwi who have been pushing for this, our local communities and our local MPs to work together to mobilise their communities. Whether that's going door to door, working the phones, waving signs, there will be a role for everybody to play here. Our political parties have different views on aspects of the COVID-19 response, but we are all united in one thing, vaccination. So Super Saturday will be an opportunity for all of us to put aside our political differences just for 24 hours and work together for a cause that we all support. A web page will be going live this afternoon with key information about the day and how people can get involved in it. We're also asking our business community, our media, and our community groups to play a role in this as well. Those that want to offer incentives to the unvaccinated to get them through the door are encouraged to do that. We'll be asking parents and grandparents to encourage young New Zealanders to take up the opportunity to be vaccinated. We want to leave no stone unturned. No one should be left behind because they haven't had the support that they need to make an informed choice about vaccination. Our response as a nation to the challenges posed by COVID-19 has been world leading, and now we need a world leading uptake of vaccination. So my request to everybody is this, let's pitch in and let's get this done. Happy to open for questions. Mr. Um, how many gang members are in this current cluster? I don't have a number, a, num a number, quite quite a number, but I don't have a precise number on that. I'll ask Dr. McWinnay whether she has a more precise figure. No, no, I don't have um, any precise number. Have quite a large number of gang members in this outbreak. Yes. Okay. And, and, and does that um, does that pose a different kind of bespoke set of public health risks if you've got people who are perhaps operating um, in the shadows? How do you how do you ensure that they're vaccinated? How do you ensure that their contact traced and the rest? I think one of the biggest things that we have to do is ensure that we get as much cooperation as possible, and do we do whatever we need to do to get that level of cooperation within reason. Um, but it does, of course, there's no question about it, it poses some bigger challenges. Some of the people involved uh, have been more active than would be consistent with the alert levels in the areas that they have been. Uh, and so that does pose additional challenges for us. But our, our focus here is a public health one. It's yeah. about contact tracing. It's about getting testing, uh, getting vaccination happening. Is it your understanding the drug deal has been part of the, the transmission of COVID in this cluster? I don't have any information. I could speculate the same as everybody else, but I don't have any specific information on that. We've seen gang leaders from the Waikato come up into Auckland and been given special exemptions. Can you let us know how many other gang leaders you've given exemptions to to come into Auckland to help facilitate the vaccine or um, the um, testing regime? So I haven't personally given the exemptions. They've been given by public health officials. My understanding, as far as I know, there are only two. Uh, who have been given those exemptions, and they have been there to help uh, ensure that there is cooperation with those who are doing the contact tracing, the testing, uh, and all of the other measures that go alongside the public health response. How important is it for people like um, like the Mangal Mob leaders to actually be getting out there and talking to these people who may not be listening to the one o'clock presses, who may not be listening to the government messaging? There's a lot of criticism of the government for granting that exemption, but is given how many gang members have, have caught it now, 
is there an argument that that's the reason that's what we need to be doing? Ultimately, our number one priority here is to stop COVID-19 in its tracks, and that means doing what we need to do to get in front of the virus with, with our contact tracing and with our testing, uh, and where we've been able to enlist gang leaders to help with that and where they've been willing to do so, we have done that. Look, I have no time for the gangs. I don't have any sympathy for them, uh, but the number one priority here has to be to stop COVID-19. So what, what do you say to people who say that you're giving them special treatment? Look, if there was another community organisation or some other entity where we needed to get someone in in order to make sure we were reaching into the places where we needed to reach to, uh, then that's exactly what we would do. Why have you been using gang leaders within... Oh, I'll just come up the back here, sir. Is there anyone with COVID unaccounted for at the moment? Sorry, what was that? Is there anyone with COVID unaccounted for at the moment? Oh, you mean in terms of we don't know where they are? Uh, well, it is possible that there are contacts out there that we are not aware of, but we're certainly doing our... Our contact tracers are doing our absolute best to find them. Um, my understanding is that everybody who has been identified as a positive case mm. is accounted for. I haven't been... Mm. I think we had, we had an issue yesterday, uh, which I think was resolved quite quickly, but I don't... As of right now, I'm not aware of anyone who's out there at large with COVID-19. Can I clarify some of the rules? Because there's still some confusion about the phase one, um, mainly because the government put up different sets of rules for these things. Can playgrounds open? Yes. Can stadiums open under alert level two with more than 100 people? Uh, I'll have to check that one for you. Can you go to the toilet if you go to your friend's house for a barbecue? No. If it involves, unless it's an outdoor toilet. Why, why are there a different set of rules for people who are socialising? So you can have two bubbles socialising up to 10 people. But if I have a group workout class, there can be up to 10 bubbles. Why is that? Uh, they'll be socially distanced. If you look at the guidelines around those kind of group activity, any, any of those kind of group activities, there are additional requirements for things like a group workout where people have to be a certain distance apart uh, and so on. So if friends want to catch up and take their yoga mat along, then that's fine. Uh, if it was part of a structured class and they were following all of the relevant guidelines, then yes, they could. It seems, it seems a bit incongruous, though, to have only two bubbles but ten bubbles. What's, what's the difference here? Well, the difference is that people are participating in a structured activity where there is, uh, you know, supervised and uh, structured distancing involved here. What supports have been given to the family of the person who's passed away at Middlemore Hospital? Uh, the um, Middlemore Hospital and the Auckland um, Clydes Manukau District Health Board um, will be putting those supports in place. Um, um, they they have obviously been looking after that person for some time, so that there will be a wraparound um, service offered to the family. Amelia, Whangai uh, isn't listed uh, on the website on the COVID nineteen website as a parenting arrangement. Why is that? Sorry. Whānau, sorry, the cultural um, practice of um, whānau raising other whānau members' children. Um, look, I have to, I, I'm happy to follow that one up and look at that as to whether or not that, that should be included there. My mother was denied passage to the Auckland border. Um, she says it's because uh, her parenting arrangement was whānau and not sanctioned by the court per se. Do you think that that's fair? Um, look, very difficult to comment on individual cases without the specific information about the case in front of me. In general, do you think that the term whānau or the cultural practice of whānau should be a reason to allow people to travel through the border? Um, potentially, but look, it's something that I'd like to go and have a look at. Could we on, have the, Amelia. on the vaccination push, what's the hold-up for mandating vaccinations for teachers? Uh, there's, uh, we, we have been consulting, I think I foreshadowed this a week or two uh, ago, we've been consulting with our, more of our health workforce uh, and we've also had some consultation uh, in recent days really uh, with our education workforce and representatives of the education workforce. Our cabinet will need to make final decisions about uh, a mandate requirement which I fully intend to take to cabinet uh, at the next cabinet meeting and then we'll be able to announce it after that. Teachers and schools should prepare a mandate is coming. Uh, if I was a teacher, um, I would certainly be making sure that I was getting my first dose of the vaccine at this point. Can we have a 
few more details just about um, the, the, the deceased. Could you just tell us, for example, how old they were, um, how long that they've been in hospital, did they have any underlying conditions? Mm. I don't have those details, but as I said, we will be able to share details later on once we've um, um, consulted with the family. Why you have those details? I mean, it's a pretty I don't, big piece of information. I don't have those details. That information was given to me this morning, but I don't have the details um, behind the death. This morning was hours ago. There should be something that we... There's conversations happening with the family, and we have to respect the family's wishes. Um, they're obviously grieving, and so when we're able to release information, we will. I personally don't have that information. Um, staff at Middlemore do. We will release that information when the family are comfortable for us I'm to release you, details. Um, we haven't made an immediate decision to do that, but it's certainly something that we will keep under review over the next 24 hours to see what we're. What, uh, well, we're, we're we're looking very closely at that. Um, it is quite a contained community, from uh, from what I gather, from the people who have been up there doing that work. Um, and th there's a good degree of cooperation and compliance there. But yes, it is possible uh, that we would extend the boundary. One of the questions will be exactly where does the boundary go to? Um, because if you take Kafia and Karapiro, that potentially extends the boundary quite a big way. And so we, we, we'll work through that. We just haven't made immediate decisions on that. Is there not a point of good chance, given the, you know, the original Reagan case, there was five days in pictures before uh, becoming sick, is there not a good chance that there, is, there are cases outside the level three boundaries now that we, you know, a number of cases outside that boundary that we don't know about? We do know a bit about the movement of the people concerned uh, within uh, within those areas, um, and that is certainly helping to isolate the risk. Uh, and we are seeing, um, you know, some really proactive activity uh, amongst that particular group at the moment. Um, but I'll perhaps ask mm. Dr. McInerney uh, whether she has an insight. Certainly, the um, I've spoken to the medical officer of health in the Waikato today, and they. I certainly um, very com they're confident that the cases are all linked. There's a very clear and strong uh, linkage with those cases. The uh, further, more widespread testing that's been happening hasn't uncovered other cases that are unlinked. And that's that's a very critical point. Wastewater um, surveillance is still negative in in and across the Waikato area. So we're uh, we're awaiting their spe their specific advice about whether or not we need to do anything particular for these two new cases outside the boundary. We'll come up to Jane. Did you hold off, um, or did the government hold off, unnecessarily meeting Pfizer um, executives last year in the early arrangements, as Nationals claimed? No, not at all. Um, look, my understanding is that Pfizer sent out a letter um, in June that was sent to a, a, a number of countries. Uh, discussions with Pfizer commenced not long after that. The um, Negotiations typically involve the signing of a uh, confidential disclosure agreement. My understanding is that that was supplied by Pfizer to New Zealand, to New Zealand's representatives towards the end of July, uh, signed very quickly thereafter. Uh, and, you know, conversations were ongoing throughout that period. Uh, so I don't think uh, we were slow there. It's also worth remembering that at that time, there were 200 different vaccines on offer and everyone was trying to sell them to us. Uh, and at that point, we had to make some judgments about what, who we thought the most likely ones to be successful were. Uh, and if you look at the four that we ended up purchasing, I think we made quite good decisions about which ones to go with. But there were a number of people, a number of companies uh, at that point saying, we've got a vaccine in development, you should buy some. And uh, Pfizer was one of the ones that we decided that we would buy, and it was proven to be a very good decision. Did you, Minister, run, into, did, did, did you run into supply issues, though, because um, of the, you know, I suppose the speed of other countries compared to New Zealand in that time frame? No, if you look at what we purchased initially, it was 700, we purchased 750,000 courses of the vaccine, so 1.5 million doses. Uh, of the Pfizer vaccine, and we did get access to those in accordance with the agreement that they entered into with us. Now, it's difficult to go crystal ball gazing back through time and say, if we'd asked for five million courses of the vaccine at that time, would we have been able to get them earlier? I don't know the answer to that, and we will never know the answer to that. We made the decision early this year to, to order those additional doses, and then they were delivered in a keeping with the schedule that Pfizer agreed with us at that time. Have you mentioned reasons, though, as we you know, continue to look at boosters and other um, medical treatments in terms of the speed and, and how six weeks can actually become a very long time in an outbreak like we've seen in the last month? 
Look, it's a rapidly evolving space, uh, and, it, and it has been since the beginning. I think if, you, if we rewound back to just over a year ago, well, it's actually more than that now, um, to when conversations around vaccines first started, uh, even the most optimistic uh, people, I don't think, were predicting that we would be this far through vaccination across the globe as we are now. The vaccines got to market very quickly, and I think we should all be really pleased about that. Um, it potentially means that the global pandemic will come under control faster than it might have otherwise, and that otherwise would have done. Um, but back then, um, there was still a lot that we didn't know. And it is always easy to look back now with what we do know now and say, could we have done things differently? Undoubtedly, yes. But we had to make uh, decisions based on what we knew at that time. I yes. Just following up on Derek's questions, um, we're, we're seeing a you know, rising number of, of cases and, and the spread you know, down to the Waikato, down to Kapia, Cambridge, um, and, and a large number of these cases infectious in the community. Are we losing control of this outbreak? As I've said, uh, my understanding and the feedback that we've had from our contact tracing teams is that they feel that the, these additional cases are reasonably well contained in the sense that they know who their contacts are, they are all linked to one another, they know what the chain of transmission was. Uh, if we start to see more cases popping up, then that changes the dynamic quite quickly. Um, but at this point, uh, the feedback we've had from the contact tracers uh, is uh, that we don't need to make it a boundary decision immediately, but we will keep that under review. And if we do feel that we need to in the next 24 to 48 hours, then we will do that, and we can do that quickly. Okay. Come up the back here. Yeah. Vaccine certificates. Uh, in terms of mandating them for large-scale events, do you anticipate that uh, sports events would be part of that in terms of you know, big... Um, rugby matches and, and what have you? We haven't made decisions about exactly where we will draw the line or what's in and what's out in terms of uh, the vaccine certificate and where you might need to produce it in order to enter. Uh, but it is likely that big events, sports games, um, you know, at Stadia, for example, uh, concerts, uh, ho big hospitality venues, those are the sorts of areas where I, I expect um, we can conclude that they're highly likely to be included. And then the question for both of you, uh, what do you make of public criticism from uh, public health doctor within the Auckland Public Health Unit, uh, who said yesterday, I'm quoting, that we couldn't get back to zero cases because COVID took hold in communities that mainstream society forgot. Our current situation is entirely due to poverty, housing, and colonization. Um, look, I think it is true uh, that COVID has taken hold in uh, some of the most disadvantaged parts of our community. In, uh, around the world, when we look at what's happening around the world as vaccination rates increase, that is increasingly the pattern uh, in, in other countries as well. COVID-19 finds the most vulnerable people in the community and it finds people who haven't been vaccinated. And often those two, commu those two groups are one and the same. And that is absolutely our experience uh, of this outbreak here in New Zealand. Are you Down the front. To engage with those communities? What was that? Have you failed to sufficiently protect those communities through vaccination and to engage with them uh, in, in, in the response in terms of contact tracing and testing? There has been a, a, an awful lot of effort put into increasing our vaccination rates uh, in those vulnerable communities, uh, including working with our haora providers, our iwi health providers, our Pacifica health providers, primary care, pharmacies, uh, putting pop-up vaccination uh, clinics in, sending the buses out. Uh, it is a difficult community to reach. Uh, they are people um, in many cases, and I don't, it's difficult to, I don't want to generalise everybody because I don't think that's fair, but we are seeing within those communities a, a disproportionate number of people who don't trust government generally, uh, and that distrust is built up over generations potentially. And so that means that we have to do different things in order to reach those communities. Well, uh, the back here. We'll, we'll come up the back and then I'll come, to, come back to you, Derek. The only one that I've got of those three that you mentioned so far is Kafia. We'll see if I can find the other two for you and come back to you. Um, the, the health database is showing 362 people uh, within the population who are eligible for the vaccine, 248 of whom have had the first dose and 149 second dose. So in percentage terms, that's 69% first dose and 41% second dose. We'll see if we can find those other two communities for you and come back to you on that. Derek, I said Derek, I said I'd come back to you. I just wanted to follow up. Are you satisfied that those teams that have been trying to reach those corners in those hard to reach communities have had the tools that they have you know, to best equip them to find them. I mean, I think the rapid antigen testing is still a trial phase, so they haven't been able to use that. Is that correct? 
And have they been, have they been able to use saliva testing? Have they been able to go door to door? Well, if we're talking about vaccination, um, yes, I think they have had good tools. Um, I think that we're, the tools are getting better. Uh, they, the, one, one, of the, one of the bits of feedback we've had around the vaccination is that there's better data, and so we're working with them to get better data. And you, you'll see that we're getting better data too in terms of granular by, by neighbourhood data. In terms of testing, um, a, a PCR test uh, is still the best way um, of identifying uh, the risk one of the things about rapid antigen tests is it's, the, the, the international evidence here is pretty clear. They're good at t detecting acute infections, so people who are already infectious. PCR tests tend to pick people up a bit earlier than a, than a rapid antigen test will. So at this point, in this particular outbreak, PCR tests are still the best option. Uh, in terms of rapid antigen tests, Dr. Verrill is leading this work. I do expect that in the, in the near future, uh, we will see rapid antigen tests more widely used in New Zealand in a wider range of settings and on a much more frequent basis. You've been disappointed with how quickly saliva testing has gotten across the line. You know, those, those people might not have wanted a PCA test on the same basis. Have they been able to, have they been offered saliva testing if they've taken over PCA testing? Well, saliva test is a PCR test. It's just a different sampling no, method. But, but the, the, the overall testing methodology is, is the same. It's just where the sample's drawn from. It's either drawn fr from saliva or, or from nose, but the processing is still the same. And, and it's the processing there that's largely the challenge because the sample has to be sent off to a lab. With a, a rapid antigen test, it can be done almost instantly on the spot. It's about 15 minutes um, to process that. Uh, when we can get to the point where we can use those much more widely, yes, we will be doing that. Uh, they are being tested at the moment. Um, we are already, uh, they are being used in this outbreak at the moment. Uh, and so we are getting good information from that. And I do expect that we'll see more rapid antigen tests fairly soon. I'll come back over to this side of the room. Uh, yeah. You'll be aware that, that 25 large businesses are asking for emergency uh, use of antigen testing, want to bring in about 370,000 tests within the next seven days. Is that a reasonable expectation on that part? Uh, look, I, I understand the underlying motivation. I think it's a good motivation, um, which is that they want to provide more tools for the people who they are working with uh, to be more frequently tested and to identify risk. I'm aware of other countries around the world where rapid antigen tests are now being widely used as part of uh, risk mitigation. One of the reasons we've been reluctant in New Zealand is that they are good uh, at detecting acute infection, uh, but detecting early onset infection, not so good. Uh, and one of the concerns there is that, uh, particularly when we're dealing with this, it's still in this phase where we're trying to stamp out every case that we get, um, they uh, potentially give people some false comfort. So, uh, uh, not within the next week, I wouldn't have thought, but I do, I do, as I said, see that um, more rapid testing will become a bigger part of our response fairly soon. Does this draft legislation anticipate the uh, commandeering of private laboratory testing of, uh, capability and, and supplies? What's the government planning in that area? Uh, nothing at this point. That is to make sure that if we need to in the, in the future, we have the ability to surge up our testing when we need to. There, there's nothing immediate on the books around that at the moment. Minister, um, did, did, did Pfizer offer in June or close to the end uh, early access to vaccines in 2020, earlier than the end of the first quarter that we eventually got them? Not to my knowledge, no. I'll come up to News Hub and you can figure out which one of you asks the question. Um, thank you. I'll go first. Thanks, guys. Um, the index case in the Waikato, did they catch COVID? Um, did they go to Auckland and catch COVID, or did someone come from Auckland and give them COVID in Hamilton? I don't actually have the details uh, details there of the the direction um, of transmission, and there's still a little bit of uncertainty between the two initial cases that reported. Which one is the index case? That um, we we still um, are working on the premise that it was the Hamilton case is the index case, but I don't have the precise details. But we do. I am informed by the public health teams there that they do have a strong connection with a case in Auckland. No one seems to be able to answer that question for us and maybe it, it points to the fact that if, if there was some nefarious activity going on within this outbreak, are you certain that these cases are being upfront with you? Uh, uh, yes, the, the, the teams have reported that cases are being um, uh, very willing to, to share information. At the beginning of an investigation like this, um, 
when a case appears in the community, you're always a bit on the back foot because you're then rapidly trying to find out what's happened. But there's no indication from the public health teams that they're not getting information uh, from, from the people concerned. Um, but also they are, um, speaking to an earlier question, they are using all resources at a community level uh, to work with those individuals and to work with their social contacts in order to make sure that we do get that information. Because obviously the more information we can get, then the more testing that we can do and um, manage any, any cases as they appear. We'll let you two have one more and then we'll come over this side. Can I just ask, why are you setting up a testing station in Tokoroa? Do you think that there are cases that far south? Tokoroa. I don't. Did I think I say that from, from the conversations this morning, I know that there's pop-up testing happening uh, around yes, yes. around the broader region uh, as part of the surveillance yeah. to see whether there anything has leaked out there and to see whether we there's anything happening there it, that we haven't picked up. It's, sorry, it's it's part of our surveillance approach yeah. where. Uh, yes, we're specifically looking at um, places of interest for case finding, but we also want an assurance that there hasn't been any further spread. So it's a general approach that we, we, we step up um, testing stations so that people can get tested. And Minister, are you disappointed that the website was changed so many times with the rules last night? Uh, sorry, look, it's, it, I don't update the website myself, so I'm not sure what the updates were last night. Um, obviously, we try and get information out that's clear and consistent. Uh, and so if there was a bit of sw switching around, then, you know... How do you reckon you've done it there, getting that clear and consistent information out there? Look, I think if you... Uh, there, there will... Some days are better than others. Um, but if you, ra if you rate it since the beginning of the pandemic, over the last 18 months, I think we've done pretty well. Yeah, Amelia? I'm, I'm sort of encouraging every Kiwi to get vaccinated. How would you both start those conversations with the hesitant. If you were in the shoes, how would you how would you open up that conversation with someone who is hesitant? Um, I think understanding the motivation for being vaccinated for those who have been vaccinated actually does help with the unvaccinated. Uh, there are some things that put people off, so generally avoid talking about needles. Um, that's pretty clear. It comes through in all of the research that needles are one of the things that put people off, so don't talk about that part of it. But talk about the underlying reasons for being vaccinated, where people have got questions about the science, you know, what does the vaccine do, um, particularly questions about the mRNA nature of the vaccine. Make sure you're referring them to someone who can speak knowledgeably about that. A health practitioner is probably your best bet there. There is some really good information from health practitioners, with health practitioners speaking, um, available online. Refer them to that information. And, and Dr. Sorry, mm. you know, with your experience, you must have had these conversations before. How do you go about starting them? Mm. Um, no, I completely endorse everything that the Minister has said. And uh, um, anti-vax um, perspectives is not something that's unique to COVID. And it's certainly something that we've experienced before with other childhood immunisations. And I think it's about being clear. It's about um, understanding what the um, concern is because people do have a, a number of concerns and, and sometimes they are as straightforward as not liking needles. Um, or often they've, they've heard something and they assume that that, that fact that they heard is actually true. So it's understanding um, what it is, what is the concern that people have and being able to step through those concerns and a conversation with trusted people, you know, people that you do trust and health professionals are, are, are um, in that category of um, highly trusted individuals. There's a wide range of, of health professionals. So that's what um, I would certainly encourage people who have concerns to talk to a trusted health professional to, to get the, the real facts. One further observation from me on that. One of the things that we are picking up uh, uh, informally and through, through the feedback that we're getting is that uh, the number of people who are staunchly anti-vax isn't a particularly large number. Mm -hmm. What we are seeing is quite a number of people who are saying, I'll probably get one just not right now. They don't necessarily see it as being something that's urgent or something that they need to do not right, right at the moment, uh, but they, they'll, they think that they'll get to it eventually. And so really one of the messages that we want to convey and what we want the rest of the community conveying is actually now is important. There is an urgent need to do this and, and please do it now. We'll come to TVNZ. Um, I only have limited information on that on the particular case, but my understanding is they did not present with COVID-like symptoms, and um, but they have tested positive since. And as part of the routine 
backward look that we do to see where people have been whilst they were infectious. Um, the ED department has then come up as a, a similar to, to a location of interest um, where the person was there whilst they were infectious and then and hence the follow-up of the staff there. And just on hospital capacity uh, throughout Auckland and in Waikato, would the staffing still down? Is there any extra capacity uh, that's been brought in or are hospitals struggling with these staff members being put, uh, down. I haven't heard any concerns from Waikato today. Um, as I say, they were getting um, rapid testing done, so results um, back quite quickly. We would expect a number of staff who have been stood down to be able to resume work. I would also expect a high number of those staff to be vaccinated already. And uh, so I haven't heard any, any comments from Waikato that there's a particular um, pressure at the moment. And certainly uh, that's one of the questions that we've been putting to all of our district health boards is um, um, have they got any concerns about their, their staffing and um, appreciating the the, uh, the pressure that Auckland has been under for some time, uh, the rest of the country, we've got confidence in the staffing there. We'll keep working along the back row there. Can I just follow on that and have my own question? There's been um, a number of exposure events though in Auckland. What considerations were made regarding those when you decided to ease level three restrictions? Um, obviously, exposure events are something that we always keep in to uh, take into account. Um, we have modified level three restrictions uh, to give people a little bit more freedom, um, but we are still at level three in Auckland. There is still risk in Auckland, and that's why we have stayed at level three, and we haven't moved further than that. So we do consider all of that. Do you regret that modification, given the spread now down at the Waikato? No, um, there's, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that uh, even the shift from level four to level three would have necessarily stopped the chains of transmission that we have been seeing through the, through the current outbreak that we're dealing with. For a colleague, uh, there's been lots of discussion on road maps. Uh, how much longer will the South Island be at level two? And is there a road map for the South Island? What would that look like? I think as the Prime Minister has set out, and we'll talk more about this in the next couple of weeks, uh, it is likely that we will start a transition to to a different way of managing the risks around COVID-19. And we, that, will, that will happen gradually. It won't be a sudden big bang. Um, but it means that level one, as we knew it previously, will probably look a little different uh, in the context of a highly vaccinated population. And our response to individual cases or individual clusters of cases will probably be different as well. Um, we're working our way through that. I haven't got any announcements to make on that today, um, but there will be more coming in the, in the coming weeks on it. On the transition away from elimination, uh, the Prime Minister has said uh, on Monday that that was only possible because we've achieved much higher vaccination rates than we had previously. I'm wondering if you can give a sense of where the, where the line was in terms of when that became more possible. You know, if we had only a third of the population fully vaccinated or uh, less than 60% of one dose, would that have been doable at that stage? Certainly getting up to 80% of the eligible population now in the vaccination programme, so at least having had at least one dose, that is, that is a good number and that is uh, very helpful. We obviously want to keep pushing, so our forward bookings now suggest that we'll get to 82% based on the people who are in the booking system. But as I've outlined, that's, we, want to go, we, we can do better than that. Uh, when I look around the world and I look at other countries who have done really well, Portugal uh, have got about 98% of their eligible population vaccinated. That's given them one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. I think if they can do that, we can do that too. So my message really is uh, every vaccination helps uh, and every vaccination puts us in a stronger position. If the rest of the country had had the vaccination rates that Māori currently have, would we be able to transition away from elimination? I wouldn't necessarily want to speculate on that. If I look at some of the countries who have been transitioning slowly and progressively down through you know, restrictions, they've generally managed, they've often started with a lower vaccination rate than we have at the moment, and they've taken small steps as we are taking small steps. And the countries that have taken that approach have tended to go back less, whereas the countries that have taken bigger steps towards removing restrictions have then had to sort of lurch backwards and forwards. So I am looking at uh, other countries, Ireland, Denmark, they have been more uh, sort of slow and steady in, in the way that they've uh, stepped down, and that's the approach that we're taking here. So we'll come over here. Well, thank you. Um, so just on boosting vaccination rates among sort of hesitant, um, so why um, the Auckland GPs only in the last six days funded to call Māori and Pacifica patients? Um, shouldn't that have sort of happened months ago, and shouldn't that be happening for sort of the rest of the country now the virus is out of Auckland? 
The um, GP practices and primary care practices are funded on a per dose delivered basis, and that model has served us quite well up until now. Uh, as we get to uh, the tail end of this uh, and the people who they're seeking to reach, uh, are more, some often require a bit more of an intensive approach, uh, then of course we do look at the way, that, the way we fund that. Um, but up until, you know, just up until the last week or so, um, the issue has been we've had lots of demand coming in and we've been making sure we're vaccinating as fast as we can as that demand for first doses drops away. And as we see, we've got to go out and push more into finding people uh, and encouraging them to come forward. That will be a bit more intensive. And so, yes, we, we do look at doing things differently. A 63-year-old man was um, arrested um, in connection um, or charged in connection with um, some protests that happened in the domain. Um, you can probably make the connection as to who that was. Are you glad to see the police taking this sort of action and would you encourage more of it? It's ultimately a matter for the police uh, and it would be unwise for me to start commenting on individual decisions around charging that they make. Mr. Thanks. They, um, obviously talking to transition now, has your appetite or tolerance for community transmission uh, no, not not at this point. Uh, and you'll see that we're still at alert level three in Auckland, still at alert level three uh, for, a, for a reasonably significant part of the Waikato region. And we will keep that boundary under review. And if there is any suggestion that the, the group that we are dealing with now uh, is not contained, then it's potential that that alert level boundary would shift. Uh, do you have any The moves that we're making in Auckland are very, very moderate, and they've been designed with, with the fact that COVID-19 could still be in the community. We've designed, uh, designed those changes with that in mind. So, so, the, so the cases climb, you know, I mean, Victoria's seen, what, 1,500 cases a day in a short matter of time, in a matter of weeks. What's your tolerance for, for, for putting more restrictions, for bringing it back up to level four? Um, I never put hard and fast numbers on that because to some extent it depends on the nature of the cases. So uh, one of the things we've seen in this outbreak is we've had a, 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 quite a number of younger people uh, in this particular outbreak uh, who haven't, who have recovered reasonably quickly. On the other hand, if we were to see a large, a larger scale outbreak amongst older, uh, you know, pockets of, of, the, of older people, then that would be more concerned because we know that the rate of hospitalisation there could potentially be higher. So it, it'll be the nature of the cases uh, that will play, will play as big of a role in those discussions as the number. Do you think you'll hold out longer now than you would have six months ago? Uh, look, we are, in, we are beginning, very, very slowly beginning a transition here. That doesn't mean that we're going to suddenly lurch into something. Uh, like I said before, looking internationally, the countries that have been slow and steady uh, in, in their changes have tended to be able to sustain that. So Any preliminary could results? Could, could Aucklanders expect these current restrictions to remain until Christmas? Uh, look, I'm, I'm not going to um, cast that far ahead at this point. Yeah. 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 The Monday decision, you obviously had public health advice for, but did you have any specific modelling done to predict what would happen just with the, just the slight changes to level three? Uh, look, the modelling is very difficult to model those things um, because they are quite small changes in terms of the modelling. But you will have all seen the modelling that's, uh, that's, that's been put out around this particular cluster. And we're still within that, within that modelling, um, it may shift which of the lines on the model we're more likely to be heading towards. Do you, but do you, do you have any public health advice um, that zero cases was no longer possible? Look, I've been on a call every morning, uh, with the exception of maybe one or two days since this outbreak began, every single morning, including the weekends at 11.30 every day. Um, I uh, have been well aware of the nature of the outbreak that we are dealing with uh, and the increasing, uh, the, the increasing reality that getting back to zero gets harder and harder as every passing day goes past. And so um, I guess I've had longer to adjust my mindset to that than people might have had who were hearing that for the first time this week. Uh, but it, I think it has been trending in that direction for a wee while. Now. We've had some people, obviously public health experts, say uh, publicly that it has been getting increasingly more difficult, but they still thought it was possible. Did you have any public health advice saying it was no longer possible? Um, I think that the advice of the Director General, certainly to Cabinet on Monday, was that getting back to zero cases was pretty unlikely, uh, and that I think we've been trending in that direction. One of the things that I would also just say is we do need to uh, make sure that we're keeping people with us. 
and uh, alert level restrictions only work if people voluntarily comply with them. We can't have a police officer on every corner making sure that everyone's doing what they need to do. And it has been a strain. Uh, and so the changes that we have made this week relieve a little bit of pressure. And if that increases the likelihood of people complying with the rest of the restrictions that are in place, it does actually potentially help us. Sorry, we're getting reports on the Whangarei essential worker returning a week Oh, sorry. Do you have any further details of a week positive case from an essential worker in Whangarei? My understanding is that there uh, is a case under investigation. Uh, the result, the, the, the test result is not yet clear as to whether or not it is definitely a case. It's someone who is based in Auckland, has, but, but, has, but was in Whangarei when they had their test taken and is now back in Auckland. That's the only information I've got at this point, uh, and it is not yet a confirmed case. So uh, it, is, it, was a, it was a test result that sits outside of the, um, in terms of the CT value, it sits outside of the range that, that allows us to determine that it's definitely a case. So I'm sure that, that person will be being retested. Uh, and so I don't have anything further on How that. How concerning is it, though, if there is a positive case in Whangarei? From time to time, over the last year and a half that I've been doing this, these, these cases that are under investigation pop up from time to time. And uh, as often as not, they turn out to be not cases. Or that it could be a, a historic infection where someone's been tested through part of regular testing and it's throwing up a very weak result. So um, the reason we don't announce cases that are under investigation, unless there's a good reason to do so, is quite often they turn out not to be cases. Now, if this is a case, uh, then clearly there'll be contact tracing. And if there are exposures or locations of interest that flow from that, then we'll release that as, as soon as we can. Uh, but at this point, like I said, it's a case under investigation, it's a potential case under investigation. It's not a, we don't have a confirmed case there. And so that, that's pretty much all the information I've got on that one. So, Minister, Minister, on, um, Minister on uh, misinformation, some other countries are looking to regulate the algorithms that push up a lot of the anti-vax material into people's news feeds. Um, what are you going to ask Facebook, Google to do on Super Saturday to reduce misinformation? Uh, look, I think Facebook and Google, from what I've seen, have already been quite proactive in uh, removing some of the biggest sources of misinformation in New Zealand. So some streams that go up beside these live streams? Oh, I've seen them on my own. I've seen them on my own Facebook page. Yes, I, I have. Promoted by the algorithms. Yeah. And so, look, I have seen that. Um, I would ask the social media companies to continue to be proactive uh, in helping to manage that. Um, obviously, I'd, you know, we want to tackle this, the source of that uh, discontent, um, which is a lot of that is just people who don't have the right facts. Um, Gina, I'm, I'm going to wrap up shortly, but we'll, yeah. Sorry, when you guys made the change from a three-week gap to a six-week gap between vaccinations, the argument was that the international evidence showed that was best practice. Now you're saying three weeks, but it, which makes it seem like that was a political decision because you were running out of vaccine at that point. Or do you admit that? No, it certainly wasn't because we were running out of vaccine, although it did allow us to vaccinate more people more quickly. Um, and that was an, an upside of it, but that was not the uh, that was not the over that was not the only consideration there, um, and that was a cons it was a consideration amongst many. Yes, and I think we were pro quite open about that at the time that that was one of the things that we considered. But I'll ask Dr. Mac I mean, we we do we make these decisions based on the advice that we get from the the technical advisory group. Uh, their advice uh, at that time was to move to six weeks. Their advice now is to three. Um, I'll let that. Two days ago, you were telling. The Ministry of Health was telling the New Zealand Herald that the optimal time is still six mm. weeks. How does that change so quickly yeah. and how do you expect people we certainly have sought further advice from our technical advisory group on this particular issue because a number, a number of health professionals have said to us at this moment in time when um, we really want to get as many people as possible fully vaccinated, uh, can people be vaccinated before the six weeks? And the technical advisory group has come back and said yes, there never was any um, uh, safety concerns with um, vaccinating at the, the three week and so from a pragmatic practical perspective at this moment in time if you've had your first dose and the only thing that's stopping you from getting your second dose is waiting for a, a six weeks mark the um, the advice is actually that can be done sooner. So then what was the main reason for changing it from three weeks to six weeks? Uh, so from recall, that was a, a combat from a, a technical advisory group. That was a combination of um, looking at the 
the um, schedules that have been used in other parts of the world. Uh, we had, um, uh, in New Zealand, we were quite, uh, quite unique in having that three-week a gap right at the beginning, which we stuck with. A number of different countries had different schedules. So we looked at what was the optimal schedule and the advice from the technical advisory group that when you put everything together, a six, a six to eight week gap was the, was the recommendation. Okay, so now you're recommending a suboptimal. So now we're saying now we're saying it's still within the realms of being optimal. I mean, it's a, it's a range. There's these these are not um, pivot points where on one day uh, because you get a vaccine one day ahead, it's it's no longer doesn't you know it, it's suboptimal. It doesn't work that way. It's a it's a range, and um, the technical advisory group has advised us that yes, we people can get that vaccine as many others have, um, so long as sooner than six weeks, but so long as you have the three-week gap, that is the bit that is fixed. It's the three-week gap between the two doses. Okay, we'll just do a couple of, couple of last questions, so we'll start with you in the front. Surely the guts of that is just basically, it was, it was deemed, the, virus, the vaccine was deemed marginally more effective if you had a six-week gap, but we're going back to a three-week gap now because Delta's here and people need to get vaccinated, right? Well, essentially, we want people to have maximum protection, and we'll get that from having double doses. Now, up the back, we'll come up the back. No, but we, we've certainly had clear feedback that I think the mood is fraying here. Oh, co correspondence, uh, you know, the, the mood on the street, the media coverage, there is clearly a... a no, no, not at all. Up the back. No, as I said, I haven't seen any evidence, uh, and certainly the, the uh, any views of our contact tracing team that the shift from level four to level three had a material effect in terms of the mm -hmm. cases that we are dealing with at the moment. Will you release the uh, health advice and cabinet documents that underpin that decision to transition away from elimination, which you know is the biggest strategic shift we've had in the pandemic since? But we're not moving away from. Elimination, our overall approach has been to continue to have zero tolerance towards COVID-19 cases, but the way we do that is going to change. Uh, and that is going to change progressively over, over a period of time. It's not a sudden shift. Uh, it's just the, as we get to a higher vaccinated population, the way, we, the way we express our zero tolerance towards COVID changes a little bit. You don't have to get to zero, so, that's, so you're, you're not eliminating. You'd uh, like to, well, but... You're confusing elimination and eradication. Yeah, over the back. Okay, we're going to have to wrap up. So you, you, one, well, you get one each. One, 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 each. Word, one word question from, from you. Now that we're making a transition in our COVID strategy, in one word, can you describe how you're feeling about that? I'm optimistic about the future. Um, there are certainly, uh, one word, optimistic. Um, medical professionals have raised major concern that roadside drug testing is unreliable. Will you hold on pushing this through Parliament? Uh, roadside drug testing isn't really something it doesn't really fit in my uh, in my domain so it's probably best to direct that to the relevant ministers would you be concerned though if it's unreliable would you want to see it being pushed through um, look like I said that's not that's outside of my domain it's not a topic that I'm particularly well briefed on so I can't really comment on that thanks everybody